Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves going again with the second part of session 16. Um, if you would like to catch up with some of these tiles we've been changing dynamically kind of in the first part of class, just go out to the Canvas site and you'll find example 16.2 that has these new improved nodes and some of that stuff. If there's anything you sort of missed out on, kind of jump <laughs> right in there. That's where I'm going to kind of go is, uh, to that set of tiles. So if you need to refresh to sort of get all the same stuff, feel free to. You know, you don't really need to, but it's uh, just always out there just in case so you don't have to feel like uh, you fell off the back of the bus. Okay, let me go ahead and, oh, in terms of where we were, in terms of trying to debug this, I'll continue to do a little debugging. I'm going to bet it's breaking down on this if part there. And somehow it's passing the value through whether it's empty or not, but I'm suspecting it's there. I have more, most trouble with the gifts than me. Not going to fix it right now, but I'm going to suspect that. I put it on my list of suspects for a little more further investigation. At least now we know that's not broken, so we'll keep on using the node, even though I don't think it's doing everything we would like it to. Okay, so here's what I'd like to do. This whole notion of going through and using this uh, kind of well loop is kind of fun and interesting. It sort of takes care of, oh, in our search space so we don't have to look through so much search space. Um, when we're looking at something like a little box over here, though, it's not so exciting because, you know, you kind of could figure that one out and there's not a very big penalty to over-computing that thing. But if we go through and look at another example, you might find a case where it's a little more useful. So let me go ahead and open up this building, for example. If you go back to 16.2, open up something called Freedom Tower. which is a rough approximation of another interesting building form that's been in the news for the last several years. This is a family that's, so oh, I don't know, very customizable in some different ways. If you were, for example, thinking about uh, putting something in the New York skyline, that had a shape which started out kind of a squarish down at its base, but then as it moved <coughs> up towards the top, tapered. Okay. Um, you could use a building form that looks like this. And this is just another Revit family. So if you want to kind of see how it's created, you can go through and edit the family. But at a high level, it has some different sort of parameters that we can play around with. It has the tower height, so let's try changing that. I can make it a 1500 story tall tower. 15 is probably not going to work. Well, 15 did something, but I'm not sure what. Make it a little bit taller. We can also go through and start adjusting. It's what I'll call the flat side. So the tower flat side. Okay, in my case, oh, let's see what that is. I believe it's the length of the flat part before the taper starts. <coughs> So let's just sort of flex that a little bit and see what that looks like. So for example, if I made that, oh, say, if the tower base is 200, let's say I'm making 190. I think what's going to happen is it's going to fl yeah, flatten out and have very kind of small little corners to it. Whereas if I make that tower flat side very <coughs> small, and I don't think I can make it zero. I can try zero and see what happens. So I don't think that'll work. Yeah, it won't work. So let me make it a little bit smaller than that, or yeah, bigger than that, like say five feet. You can get that shape. And that shape may be somewhat familiar to you. So this basic thing has the ability to go through and flex around a little bit, kind of similar to the tower in New York. If we were thinking about trying to evaluate this shape, I like the shape in that it's a little complex in terms of understanding what's going on here. It's not as easy as the box, so if you wanted to go through and figure out what's going on in terms of how much floor area, how much surface area, how much volume you've created, yeah, it takes a little bit of work. So we could go through and play games with this. We could go through and say, great, you know, kind of given these parameters, really what height would we have to achieve in order to get a certain amount of square footage of floor area? Now, it's a little complex in terms of what's going on because it's not as simple as just kind of chopping. What happens is because we're maintaining that shape, 
if we compress the size of the tower, the lower floors start getting bigger because it's trying to hold that shape. So it's a little bit strange. We could do that for a single thing like this, varying the height and kind of saying, oh, if we wanted to guarantee that we had, you know, at least a certain sort of floor area or no more than a certain floor area. Or we could play it other ways. We could go ahead and try changing, oh, for example, the flat side of it and stopping when we exceed a certain amount of floor area because we're capped by the total amount of floor area we can build on it. Yeah, there's a number of variables we can sort of change with it. And it's really just a matter of trying to figure out like really what it is you want to change. We can change the base, we can change the height, we can change those flat sides. I've locked some of the other ones in here, but you have a number of variables. And the key is, okay, so great. For this shape, like, you know, really do what we want it to be. So let's just get a hook up the really simple, kind of loop it together for this. And then we'll think about trying to compare pairs of values. Because what ends up happening is, if we go through and, for example, change a pair of values, it's a little more subtle about whether or not you've exceeded that. And if we start doing pairs of values, the search space gets very, very large, okay, so that the notion of stopping when you exceed the value of a maximum or a boundary condition becomes very important to you. Okay, just so you're not doing that. So let's just try and hook this up in kind of using the same sort of logic we have been using. What we'll do is we'll go back to Dynamo. And just using the same logic we've already been looking at, let's go back. I'm going to open right back in 16.2. We're not going anywhere too far. Where was that place where I, oh, that's the testing loop. That's it. <coughs> Exploring the image while condition is true. That was that. Did I not save all my fantastic work? Entirely possible. I'm going to go to setting element to target value. I'm going to go to 3B. I'm still in 16 too. Okay. I'm going to go to 3B. It's the same basic sort of logic. I got this looping condition. I'm going to go through and test the loop. This is actually, it looks like it's the same function. Let's just sort of mess around with it a little bit. OK, the init, I got all that. Okay, let's just try testing this and see if we can make it happen for our freedom power. So to apply this to this instead, what we'll do is, let me zoom that over, pan that over. Now, again, for what we're doing today, just kind of this basic oh, volume, area, that type of stuff's pretty simple. Imagine if we were thinking about the energy use or something a little more interesting. So I can go back over here and select. I thought I was selecting. There we go. Okay, in terms of the parameters we want to change, let's go back over here and see what we have available to us. We have, looks like tower height is my variable, not just height. So I'll go back and change it over there. Okay, in terms of its initial value, oh, since we know we're already pretty tall up in there, let me go ahead and I'm going to start at 1,000, something like that. Even over here, I'm going to put the 1,000 in there just so I get a sense of how big the very, uh, number is that I'm sort of shooting for. OK, so for this, what do we have here? Our gross floor area is around 2 million six. OK, so let's go ahead and say we're going to start at 1,000. For our value increment, you know, if we were going to go through and allow floor-to-floor -floor heights, let's say this thing had oh, like a 14 or 15-foot floor height, something like that. So our increment 
for the height will be, we're gonna test these different values of like 14. Actually, let me even do this. Back over here, let me just put in the same value that we have over here. If I go to the uh, floor to floor in the elevations, that make more sense to actually match that. What kind of number is that? That's <laughs> like a little more than 12 feet. That's a really weird number. <laughs> I'm so confused about where that number comes from. It's a, it's, you have a, uh, set an array? to equal. You, so oh, I see. I don't know if it's dynamic. I was trying to figure it out too. It must you be, know, yeah. The it first 100 floors or so are set to equal, yeah. and it was flexing somehow. But okay. now, that, now it doesn't change. When you, set, when you change the height, it doesn't change this. I'm not sure. So we'll say 12 foot 8, more or less. I should probably fix that up. 12 foot 8 is going to be, what, 12.6, I believe. 6.6, six, six, something like that. OK, so from a test value increment, it's going to be something like 12.66. Super. So we're going to kind of ratchet this up. In terms of what we're going to check against, though, how about let's go for the gross floor area. Come back over here to my 3D. So I got my gross floor area. It's about 2,631 right now. Let's go ahead and let's try just continuing to make this thing bigger and bigger up until, oh, let me try, say, oh, I would say 3 million. That might take a while. I'm going to say 2.8 million and see, see what that is. I have no idea how big this is going to take. So the target value, it's going to be over here. We'll say the gross floor area. We'll say two eight zero 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 zero. Okay, believe it or not, that should work. Let's go ahead and take this target value. I'm going to put it over here as my function. As Diana suggests, we need to kind of fill that other hole. Got the height there. Got my test value there. Let's go through and give it a result data file. So I'll put it out on my desktop. And I'll say 16.2D. Okay, I think we're sort of hooked up. Anyone see any holes in this scenario? Okay, always give it a try. Okay. Let's go ahead over here. I like this so much. I'm even going to do a little save as. I'm going to call it my 3B. I'll call it 3F for Freedom Tower. Try that. OK, cross your fingers. Let's see what breaks. says something started. I don't see much action yet. Oh, you know what it is? It's my mass is still selected back over there. I did this last time. If the mass is still selected, then it won't run. There it goes. That's looking good. <laughs> Ah, looks like it didn't take too long to get to 2 million eight. Yeah, let's see how we did. So, well, we'll figure out what broke. Okay, my gross floor area is 2 million seven here at a height of 1,063. So just a few more floors to that. Okay, good news is, yeah, I can make it a little bit bigger and make it more interesting, but what broke, Mr. Jordan? Oh, yeah, in fact, let's even go ahead and take out that function. It's, it's because I plugged it twice. It's what's happening here is, in this case, yeah, just let's take out function apply. We're just going to go ahead and plug the value in directly. 
Function apply is kind of an interesting thing. It kind of has the effect of plugging the hole. So when I connected that, that together here, I don't need the function apply as the argument. That should work. See, I wasn't actually working on this one, was it? Let's go here. I should be able to just kind of take that over to here and get rid of the function apply. I don't think my function apply is necessary. Because all the function apply does is it basically takes a function and plugs in a value. But we've plugged it in directly. I'm going to go through and test that. I think it's going to work. OK. Let's see what's going on again. OK, I am feeling so emboldened by the fact that this thing actually sort of worked a little bit well that I'm going to say, let's go through and make it 3 million. Try running that. See what happens. Run started, a little while looping going on. Let's see what happens. It's not dancing yet. Oh, my, oh my, I had the mask selected again. <coughs> Notice I have the mask selected again. It's still over in green. So I have to unselect it. There it goes. There, the tower is starting to grow. Looking pretty good. Okay, so at 3 million, if that was my target, it looks like it was able to achieve 2,980,000, which is actually not too bad for the size of the floors. And it was able to do it in 1151 was 12 feet too tall. So we're going to subtract that off and get that instead. It is 1139. Okay, so not too awfully bad. Now, this is sort of a really simple sort of example just in terms of flexing the height. But I want you to think about if instead of just sort of flexing the height, if we did something a little bit different. If we took, and as opposed to using this function, which uses a single value, if we took that function that uses multiple values, and we flex, oh, for example, the height and the width of the flat side, or we <coughs> somehow flex the base and the width of the flat side, we flex two different values, okay? We'd still go through and evaluate, we get our result parameter. That result parameter would still be compared next to whatever our boundary condition, our cutoff condition is, okay? but we can start trimming a much larger space by using the well loop for that. So yeah, we'll play around with that some more next week in terms of doing that, because I think this sort of issue of, for example, taking these interesting tower shapes and flexing them, you know, their height, their width, their twist, their taper, all that stuff, that's what you're going to play around with on the site. Okay, so just kind of think of that as a little preview. We'll kind of keep on playing with that, but the well loop is a pretty good way to go through an approach thing. And it's always the same sort of evaluation as a list map, but it's always returning a value or looking for a value and testing against that maximum and then stopping. Okay, kind of makes sense? Beauty, okay. Let's go ahead. I'm going to shift into the last example I want to talk about today is the genetic algorithm example, just so we can get it out there for you and you can sort of compare what it's useful for relative to while looping because it's a really innovative concept and it's really the way a lot of very big optimization is done. The idea is there are these algorithms which allow us to go through and if we use kind of a genetic approach, so if you sort of think about there being certain sets of characteristics that are more favorable than other in terms of achieving desired results, it biases towards the favorable characteristics in terms of trying to find out, you know, develop the uber building or the uber shape or the uber or whatever you're trying to get at. Okay, so this is all sort of done. Uh, there's a, someone whose name is Muhammad who actually works at Autodesk now, he was working at Texas A&M when he did this. Okay. Um, in the folder full of goodies, there is a, a paper, if you go on out to, I'll see if I can find where my folder full of all this stuff is. There's a paper out here which describes sort of an application of this. There's a GitHub site where he actually maintains 
kind of the whole uh, system for doing this. But think of this as basically being a series of algorithms and nodes that are really good for, you supply the evaluation function, you supply the object, but what it does is as opposed to listing through, it uses this sort of approach. Okay. It basically sends out different scouts into the available search space and has all the scouts report back on like how good the result was that they achieved. And then the scouts that achieve the best results, okay, when we send out the next generation of scouts, bias towards the places where the good scouts sort of had their results. So what happens is you have populations of points or populations of places you're searching, and you can choose how big that population is. And then for every generation, okay, you sort of allocate that in what is considered to be the most favorable area. So if I send out a population of 50 the first time, it'll just be completely randomly scattered across the space. The second generation that I'm going to send out is going to have the knowledge from the first generation so they won't go randomly, they'll be a little bit biased towards the spaces that seem to be the best. Okay? 50 will again go out. Okay? Based on their results, we'll again send out a new generation. Every generation gets closer and closer and starts really converging on what the optimums are. So it's really a nice approach because as opposed to having to search through millions of different possibilities, you can often in a very short number of iterations start converging on the spaces that are really very, very good. Okay. So in principle, that's what's going on. But we'll go through and demonstrate it through a pretty simple example, which is really all about points and points on a surface and then trying to find the minimum point on that surface. Okay. The same principle is going to apply to buildings, but it's sort of the idea of really how you do generation after generation and do it as research. So if you can, Go ahead and open up 16.3. Let me tell you what we're going to do. The actual algorithm, in fact, will load in this you know, on your system, because I think you'll probably need to load this in your system, is something that Mahalik put together. We went through and kind of did a series of iterations to kind of make it better and a little more visible in terms of what's going on. But let's just start by running what he did. And to do that, what you're going to do is come back over, let's open 16.3, and then we're going to load in the Dynamo or the Optimo package. So I'm going to open up 16.3. I'm going to open, let's open the metric one. I sort of learned about this. It's sort of based on the units, and this thing is basically you know, like 100 meters by 100 meters. We have to, if we, if we use metric, it'll ca cover the entire field. It's just sort of based on the size. So here's a surface. Now, we are pretty good at spotting where the minimum point on that surface is. You know, computers have a harder time figuring that out. So here's the basic approach we're going to be using. If you could think about that as really being a field, okay, and there's the surface. We're looking at it from the top right now. If we basically scattered points across that field, we sort of said, hey, you're like 100 by 100. We're going to scatter points randomly across there. What it's going to do is, we're going to plot points in individual spots, and we're going to put them just on a flat plane. Then we're going to project a line up and see where you intersect with the surface and report back that height. Okay? And in the scheme of talking about Dynamo or Optimo, you know, that's considered the evaluation function. So the populations are all these points. Every point has two input values. It has an x value and a y value to kind of say where you're going to go. And how you're going to evaluate your fitness is we're going to go on out there, we're going to plot a line straight up, and then we're going to see what we intersect with. Okay, and that's going to be the height at that point. Okay, so that's generally how this is approached. So let's go back in and we'll open up Dynamo and see how this all works. In terms of Dynamo, there's a new package you're going to have to load. You may have to load. We'll see if it's on your machine. It's called Optimo, but Optimo has the necessary components for what we need. So I'm going to start by opening, oh, under 16.3. I'll just open 1B. So 
So let's go out and take a look. If you open 1B, chances are you're looking at some red nodes right now. And the reason you're looking at some red nodes is there's some functions. There's this, oh, this NGS, NSGA, something, uh, non, non something genetic algorithm. It's a GA, that's the best form. Um, GA function. These three are the Optimo nodes. So those are hanging out on red on you right now. We just need to download and uh, install Optimo for you. So if we do that, we'll go up to packages. Let's see if we can find Optimo. We'll go to search. See what's hanging around up that, that was amazingly quick this time. <laughs> I'm used to that taking a long time. Okay, let's try Optimo. Looking good. It's actually been quite a while since uh, he uploaded it. It hasn't really changed very much with the different versions of kind of uh, Dynamo. So if you don't have that installed, go ahead and install that. And when you do install that, hopefully those red nodes are going to turn black. Yep. What you and now that to, now they're in it, why don't you just close this, the the Dynamo script and reopen it? So <coughs> we'll come back. When you reopen, hopefully Optimo will be showing up over here in the little browser. Okay, looking better. Okay, excellent. Looking good, Miss Britt. You looking good? Um, yeah, there are two that are resolved, but I think I have to reload them. Okay. It seems like just sort of, uh, yeah, just closing it all down and bringing it back out. It seems to do it. How about Mr. Amir? Look good? Okay, so I think it probably is doing what it should. Okay. Right, is this, this example just set up based on following that PDF, the instructions for how to do a surface? Yes. Yeah. This is, this basic example starts with, this is di our, it, it really is Muhammad's example, and then we just sort of start enhancing it a little bit. But let's walk you through the logic and show you how it all works. As we start over here on the left-hand side, you'll see there's this thing called the MSGA Initial Solutions List, and that's a population, okay? That's the initial population. Here's how it basically works. We have the notion of a population size, that's how many points, how many scouts we're gonna send out, there's gonna be 50 of them. There is this notion of the number of objections, objectives, that's how many different functions we're gonna use to evaluate their strength. Okay. And we're only going to use one function. We're going to use one function that says, give it an x and y, tell me what your height is. Okay, that's the number of objectives. Upper and lower limits. This is a list of items that are going to be the different um, like input values to this function. So for example, having a lower items list with two things means that it's going to generate an x value and a y value or actually the lower limit of the x and the lower limit of the y. The upper limit is going to be the upper limit of the x and the upper limit of the y. So all together, this is basically going to create a series of different points that are going to go anywhere from 0 to 90 in the x and 0 to 90 in the y. Okay. That initial solution list is actually going to be a list of 50 points. You have a bunch of x and y's. Okay. What happens is that gets function applied down to a list of fitness functions. So what happens is we're going to feed in a population, that's the x and y points. We're going to evaluate them all based on the space, and it's going to return a bunch of different values, kind of for what the height is. Okay, that is actually going to come on over here. We have a population list, we have a fitness <laughs> list, that's looking good. Okay, this function over here, this NSGA2 function, that's going to go through and say, hey, for every individual kind of set of results in terms of the fitness functions, okay, I'm going to go through and regenerate a second generation for you kind of based on those fitness values and try to get closer to the ones that are doing a little bit better. And it's just going to go through and loop and do that. What it's going to do is it's going to loop a certain number of iterations, so it's going to be six iterations. It's going to keep on going up to six iterations, but it's going to go through and keep on looping and evaluating and ultimately report out sort of where the data points are at six iterations in, or however many iterations in, in the lower here. And 
This part over here is just going to plot some coordinates. So let's just run it and kind of show you and walk you through it and we'll kind of take it apart and figure out how to debug it for what we need a little bit more next time. Okay, we need to go through and make sure the face is selected. It should be, but just in case, you can say change. <clears throat> Get out of that mode over there. There we go. Shift W over here. OK, let's try that again. I'm going to change and choose that face. I'm going to pan that over just so you can sort of see it. I'm even going to orbit my face around a little bit, just so I can sort of see the bottom of it a little bit better. So here's the idea. We're going to generate 50 points. We're going to see how it's going. Actually, as a starting point, let's do this. How about if you come on over here and where it says iteration number, let's stop it after, for example, two iterations and see how it's doing. OK, so as opposed to letting it run for six iterations, Let's just put a 2 in there instead. And give it a run. Let's see how this thing looks. OK, so you should hopefully be seeing a lot of different points kind of floating around in here. What happened was, this is two iterations. At two iterations, we're kind of hanging out right here. If you want to sort of even see a little bit of a difference, try backing it off to one iteration and rerun that. Don't worry about the error message, because there's a little cleanup we have to do. But try running it with one. OK. So we've got a lot of points out there. Some are looking pretty good. Some aren't quite so good. If we come on over here and we run it for like three iterations, you'll see in three iterations, it's getting pretty darn close. It actually has sort of two things that it's sort of focused in on. This area at the bottom of this trough, this kind of edge area looks pretty interesting too. Interesting, that one it did sort of give it up on. But it's sort of considering these, let me just kind of orbit that a little bit so we can get a better sense of what, where the real spot is. Okay. If you run it for four or five, you'll see it'll get amazingly close. So they're all sort of coalescing down there in the bottom. Okay. Back over here. If you ran this like seven, I think you're pretty much there. At some point, you've got to decide when you want it to stop. Because you can keep on generating points. You know, if at some point, oh, 80% of them are within a certain range of each other, you might be able to say, hey, OK, I'm satisfied. That's pretty darn close. Okay. But this is actually a pretty efficient way of going out and finding um, these uh, endpoints. So just to give you a sense of really what it's doing, if you come on back over into this initial solutions list and we start looking at these lists, let's just kind of take a look at what's happening. I'm going to just take a look at the initial solutions list. That was the very first one, going from 0 to 90 in the x and y direction, 50 points. So what you'll see the initial solutions list looked like is it had two major lists. There were a bunch of X points, points, starting with 29 and moving on down. There were 50 of them. In the second list, there were the Y points. The third list, you might wonder what it's doing, the one that is index 2. That's actually going to be the results. So that will be the Z values that are reported back. The fitness function will actually fill those in. And then it will use that X, Y, and that Z to figure out really what it wants to be. So that's the initial solution list. What happens, though, is as it goes through and does its iteration and it continues to do these lists, okay, 
you'll see that a little bit later on, the results are filled in. Okay, those are the values for the height of the points. That's, I think, the first set of results. This is later on. That's a function. We kind of take you out to where we really are. At the tail end of all this, what's passing through the loop is this. There's actually two sort of big things passing through. There's this thing that I'll call the data structure. The first value of the data structure is actually, or the first thing in the list that gets passed around is just the iteration number. Let's see if I can pop this out. Can I do it there? Not there. I'm going to put a watch on this. Put a watch on this thing. What's getting passed through this time and time again is, let's let that do its thing again. Okay. It's going through and passing the iteration number. This was iteration number seven. It's passing the x values, it's passing the y values, and it's passing the z values for that generation. So there's a lot of information. You can see here all the z values that are all hanging around. You get 4.89 or something like that. It's kind of doing what we want to do, but it's not necessarily the most uh, transparent about what it's doing. It's kind of a big opaque black box. So what we're going to do in this example is to sort of pull it apart and really use to learn to use this infrastructure to do something that's a little bit closer to what we want. And what we're going to do with it, just so you get a sense of where we're going, is if I come back over here, as opposed to doing these points on a surface, we're going to go through and use the same infrastructure to go through and try to do multiple towers. So let's come over here, let that open. Where we'll go next time is we'll say, hey, you got a population of points. That looks pretty interesting. What if you thought about a population of buildings? So for all these different potential buildings that might be on this site, we have a whole range of different values. Okay. Here's a population of buildings shapes. Okay. And what we're going to do is, in the same sense that they were varying x and y, we're going to vary the height, the width, the slope, the twist, all these different values for all these populations. And based upon the things that we're concerned about, whether it's the gross area, whether it's the energy use intensity, whether it's a daylighting value, we'll use those as fitness functions. And based on those, we'll try and figure out which of those different building shapes is the most favorable. Okay, so it's just a way of trying to evaluate a lot of different buildings in parallel and try to really coalesce on what we think the best value are, our values and our shapes and forms could be if you have a lot of different potential variables and you want to try changing all at the same time. Okay? So that's where we will go next time and we'll actually apply that to our final exercising class which will be giving a kind of shape and some basic conditions about that. You trying to figure out what you think the best condition or shape is for that building and we'll report back on that. Okay. Let us adjourn for today then. Have yeah. yourself a fantastic weekend and uh, take care of everything else you need to get taken care of since you're sort of having it easy on this one and we'll really make it a very concise and compact experience because I know uh, the end of the quarter is coming faster than we all want it to. Or maybe that's not true. <laughs> That is the reason why you have a huge number of buildings. Is that like one iteration? Send it seven different values. Exactly. It's okay. really a single population. We could do them all independently. Yeah. I, when I make this whole sort of generation together, just so I can see a bunch of evaluations together. Gotcha. So then what happens is you can almost start to see the building start taking on the same form. In any generation, you can see yeah. all the variations. And then every successive generation, yeah. you see them getting closer and closer towards an optimum. Yeah. Okay. This looks really cool, because I but I'm wondering, so the CSV file that out, out 
um, that writes out of that yeah. only shows like the last pop the last generation. Currently, it does. It'd be interesting if we could basically have an Excel file that showed the two, three, or four variables that we varied, the yeah. the output yeah. or the outputs that you want to some function to measure those, a metric to measure those, and then also to be able to see it visually. That's what that we, would be an awesome output. That's what we do. So if okay. you follow this through and you start looking ahead, what we're going to do is the way it's written by default, it only puts out the end point, but we then start writing out every generation on the yes. while loop so you can see that, and we start taking snapshots you of every... You can take snapshots out of Revit too? Yeah. Oh. So you can this see the so shape changing. So you're heading exactly where we're going. If you want to look ahead, just follow through that example. Cool. Let me stop this.